Good morning and welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council's online briefing for faith leaders. In today's program, we discuss and shine a light on the Tenderloin Emergency Initiative. The San Francisco Interfaith Council online briefings are supported by a grant from MetaFund. Thank you. The important ongoing work of the San Francisco Interfaith Council would not be possible without generous funding from congregations, corporations, faith-based social service agencies, foundations, judicatories, and supporters like you. Help us spread the word. Visit sfinterfaithcouncil.org to learn about SFIC programming and how to become a supporter. Follow SFIC on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe to SFIC's YouTube channel to watch all of our previous virtual events. A bit of housekeeping. Today's program is being recorded. For audio and video, all participants are muted and without video to minimize distraction. To submit a question or comment, select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to Q&A. Questions will be forwarded to the presenter for their review following the program. To activate closed captions, select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and click enable live transcription. Recently, a federal judge struck down the federal mask mandate for airplanes and public transit. Currently, masks are still required on SF Muni, and even if this changes, masks will be a good option. Businesses can still require masks to enter. Thanks for working together, San Francisco, to prevent the spread of COVID. For more information, go to sf.gov forward slash COVID. San Francisco does, does not require proof of vaccination to enter restaurants, bars, gyms, and other settings where food and drink is consumed or elevated breathing occurs. However, proof of vaccination is required to enter large events. Learn more at sf.gov forward slash COVID. Vaccines are safe and effective. Go to sf.gov to find a vaccine site or vaccine event in your neighborhood. Now is the time to come together San Francisco. Together we can stop Asian discrimination, bias, hate, and violence. The COVID-19 virus has no race or nationality. It is simply a disease. To report a hate crime, call the SFPD at 415-553-1133. And at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey, and thank you for all that you do in, uh, in order to facilitate these programs. I know that you are uh, facilitating this program from Thailand, so it's an, it is a, an international event today. Um, good morning. I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I want to welcome you to this week's online briefing for faith leaders. This is our 76th uh, uh, such briefing since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the Tenderloin Emergency Initiative is a community and city effort to promote a thriving Tenderloin neighborhood by connecting people to the services they need, improving safety, and investing in the neighborhood. The initiative is led by the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management and engages multiple city agencies and community organizations. This week's online briefing for faith leaders, hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council, welcomes San Francisco Department of Emergency Management Executive Director, Mary Ellen Carroll, who will present on this critical, timely, and innovative initiative. Now, in, initi in addition to being the chairman of the board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, uh, Nancy Nielsen, for many, many years, was the Deputy Director of Lutheran Social Services, a, a faith-based social service agency located in the Tenderloin. So it, we, it is doubly important that she should be with us today. Today, she will offer a greeting on behalf of the Board of Directors of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, as well as to uh, read the interfaith statement read at the beginning of each of our programs. Nancy, it's wonderful to have you with us uh, for all the reasons stated and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, and good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. This is a particularly important presentation today that I think has, will have meaning for all of us. Um, as Michael said, I've been part of the Interfaith Council for a number of years and, and also part of LSS. This is near and dear to my heart. 
So is the statement that we start with every meeting to welcome you all. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are all invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we are very, very blessed to have with us today the Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr, uh, Bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, Bishop Megan is no stranger to the work of the Interfaith Council, uh, the Tenderloin, uh, or, or our, just our, our basic interfaith work in, in San Francisco. Uh, she walks the walk. And uh, we are very blessed to have you with. I hope you had a beautiful Holy Week at Easter, Bishop Megan. Um, please lead us in a reflective moment to ground us uh, in the uh, presentation that, that, that we will enjoy in just a few moments. Welcome everyone. I've I've been sewing in the background. You can't tell because I'm not very far into it. Every time there is a, a turbulent season or a time of um, being being stuck in my house with my kids and things get a little topsy turvy. I have an eight and a nine year old and they're very boisterous and loud. And um, in a small house. Uh, there's not a lot of room to play when you don't have a backyard. And so sometimes we'll venture down to the Castro to Cliffs Variety and they have a little section where you can pick a positive phrase or a funny thing to cross stitch. Um, and so our whole family will sit and try to figure out how to cross stitch. Now I was uh, what you might call formally trained in cross stitch. Uh, when I was a small child, I was in Future Homemakers of America um, at the boys club and uh, learned that it doesn't only matter the stitching that you put on the front of your cross stitch. No, that anyone can make the front of their cross stitch beautiful. And I don't say that uh, to shame anyone who couldn't make the front of their cross stitch beautiful or who has tried. But the true uh, worth and merit of a cross stitch, for those of you who really know, is if you look at the back of the cross stitch. And if the back of the cross stitch is neat and you have gone in a thought out pattern and all of your, and the back of the cross stitch is as beautiful as the front, uh, then you have truly cross stitched to perfection. And I think that's sort of what we hope people will be up to when they're thinking about issues like addiction and mental health and homelessness, that the thought and the care behind all of the programs and the planning will be as careful and as neat um, and as beautiful. But when it comes to things being declared emergencies or wondering how to do your best rapidly with um, limited numbers of resources and a whole lot of feedback, it can be really difficult because there's lots of different colors of yarn and lots of different ways that you're trying to just manage what's going on from day to day. So here we are set to listen to people who are trying to do cross stitch, uh, hoping we can peek behind what's happening and have that be a faithful moment. Part of the reason that I'm blathering on about cross stitch today is I've been thinking deeply about the Lenten texts that are the rhythms of the Judeo-Christian cycles. And we have this, this night uh, called Holy Saturday, where we try to read all of the sacred scriptures that tell us the history of the whole world. And the whole point of the hours long scripture readings is for us to remember that there is a beloved God who is as thoughtfully as a cross stitcher, thinking about every cell in our body and creating us, every leaf on this globe, one of the sacred stitches that makes this tapestry a beautiful and sacred space. And whether or not we see ourselves as someone following in the footsteps of a Messiah or a savior or of Elijah, um, 
we are hopefully to be people who are adding our own stitch, unique and beautiful to this world, doing what we can to try to make this space a better place. Sometimes we're successful. Sometimes we got to take it out. Uh, sometimes we just hide the cross stitch and start over, um, but seeking nonetheless to do the best we can in times like these. I've been thinking about also the, the things that uh, in the Lutheran tradition, we, we confess not only for the things that we have done, but for the things that we have left undone. And so all throughout Lent, we have this rhythm of prayer where we keep saying, and we are sorry for the things we have done and the things that we have left undone. And thinking about the ways that there are spaces in what we've been able to do that are about trying to fill in the gaps of the places where we need to have justice happen in the world. And maybe we haven't gotten to that stitch yet. Uh, in, in sacred text, I, when I think about the, the story of, of creation, that story of Adam and Eve, there's this story of God putting, putting Adam to sleep, this clay creature who has both male and female parts, surgically removing something. And then it says, you know, it kind of fast forwards through the story to the part where they wake up and it says, and we have male and we have female and, we, and they are doing these things out into the world. My favorite part, however, is that pause, the gap in the story between the end of one sentence and the beginning of the next, where God must have sewed, right? At the end of the surgery, the surgeon who puts you to sleep and helps remove things, there's a part at the end where they sew you back up and scarring takes place and a whole healing process happens. And somewhere in the space of that story is the healing and the sewing. We have another story where Jesus is trying to figure out who the disciples should be. And Jesus is walking along the shore, looking out at the boats. And I always, as a small child, I thought Jesus must be psychic. Jesus knows good leadership skills just by looking at a boat. Uh, and then as I read the text, in one of the, the recounts of the story, it says Jesus looked into the boat and saw disciples who were sewing their nets in a time when only the women on the shore sewed their nets. And we don't know if they were sewing their nets because they were trying to break gender boundaries or gender rules, or if they simply were poor and they couldn't afford to have the women sew their nets together. But nonetheless, Jesus picks the disciples who are sewing in their boats. And then later, when there is a story that we think about during the season of Easter, there's this story of Jesus coming back in the world and not necessarily being recognized because of the flesh and the bones uh, that he carried, but they recognize Jesus when all of a sudden, the people who are out in their boat fishing, their nets feel so full of fish that they start breaking. And it occurred to me that that's the moment Jesus would need sowers to be able to collect the abundance that existed, to bring it into the shores and to feed everyone who is hungry and who is able. And so today I, I celebrate everyone who is seeking to do their best, seeking to try to be a part of this beautiful tapestry in the world, whether it's beautiful on the outside um, or on the back of the ways that we are stitching together, that to remind you that you are called in the sacredness uh, of your faith to be someone who is seeking to love your neighbor, to do the best you can with your resources. And when it feels like there is a tear, to be sowers who seek to share abundance, to unclog that stream of injustice, to make it possible for all to have what they need, and to seek to do our best in all that we are able to. So I offer you blessings this day, that you have time to slow, time to sow, time to be present, time to share, and less triage and more intentional love for all. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Megan. What a beautiful segue into today's presentation. And I just would like to acknowledge and 
recognize all of the sewers that are on attending this program today. I looked through the attendees and so many of them are working so hard in the Tenderloin uh, and in social service agencies. And I just wanna say thank you to you. You are the boots on the ground that, that are making the difference. Um, Bishop Megan ended her reflection talking about response, but then again, intentionality. Uh, the San Francisco Interfaith Council uh, was born out of two crises. And as a result of those two crises, a homeless crisis and the Loma Prieta earthquake, we've worked very closely with the Department of Emergency Management and its directors uh, over our 32-year uh, history. Uh, Mary Ellen Carroll came on board a year before the pandemic. Uh, I think we call this baptism by fire. Um, and uh, so we had a chance to work very closely with her throughout the pandemic uh, uh, to, to the present. And uh, Mary Ellen, we are very thankful to have you with us, the director of San Francisco's Department of Emergency Management. I think what impresses me about what you're doing with this program is it's not as much responding to a crisis as using some intentionality. And because I think that that's what initiative suggests, um, recognizing there's a crisis, but also coming at it with some intentionality as the Bishop uh, mentioned at the, at the conclusion of her reflection. Uh, we wanna give you the floor now to talk about this initiative um, and ways that we can be partners with you in this initiative. And then we have a number of questions from our faith leaders uh, that we'd like to put to you uh, for a response. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. And um, frankly, I always find myself very emotional when I'm here. I'm trying, I think last time I cried, so we'll, I'll try to hold it together. <laughs> um, you know, I wanna thank Bishop Megan. So much of that resonated um, and sort of gives me a lot to think about. I don't know that our stitches are all that pretty on the front or the back right now, especially when it comes uh, to our efforts in the tenderloin, but we are certainly learning as we go and our, and our intention um, is to bring uh, some peace and some um, order, I think, uh, in a way that a cross-stitch project does. Um, so um, I will, I have a presentation which will give some background information and kind of tell you where we are and how we got here. And then, um, you know, as always with this group, I think the discussion that we can have after gives us the most benefit. Um, I really value uh, the work that the Interfaith Council has done, continues to do. Um, Michael, thank you for your leadership, but thank you everyone. Um, you were part of uh, a very critical component of saving lives uh, in, in our city, which we absolutely did countless lives. Um, and so, you know, I really thank and honor you for that. So talking about saving lives, let's talk about the Tenderloin Initiative. Um, we, um, you know, <laughs> so we are emerging, uh, hopefully from this pandemic in some ways, um, and San Francisco has is standing as a global leader really in emergency response in this emergence from, from COVID. And again, a lot of that is because of community and the work that we did together. Um, the lessons that we learned about providing relief and care while partnering with community are really fueling the initiative in the Tenderloin. Um, and it applies, those lessons apply for the day-to-day -day crisis that we are experiencing today. Um, and so, um, and so I just also want to say a little bit that um, we and the team in particular that is working on this had very little uh, break in between shutting down our COVID command and diving into um, the tenderloin. Um, and so I just want to also acknowledge that as human beings, I think we all have experienced harm, that we have all experienced pain through the pandemic. And I know that on the part of my staff and emergency management and public health, um, 
no one got a break. Uh, and so um, I just am so uh, thankful for everyone that is doing this work, however imperfect. Um, they're doing it with a couple less limbs than they had before from an, an, an analogy perspective. They're a wounded army, but yet they uh, continue. So I just wanna acknowledge that. All right, let's jump into it. Um, this is just the overall timeline. Uh, we started in November of last year. Um, we asked uh, where we were basically doing assessment, um, coordinating with city and non-city stakeholders to sort of figure out Okay, we know there's a crisis, but how do we how do we define those what those crises are and put them in a priority? Um, and then in mid December, we really dived into our crisis operations, um, which is where we remain now. Um, and this is the phase in which city and community teams work together, um, primarily connecting people who need it to services to intervene in harmful activity that is happening in the community and then to uh, repair infrastructure. Um, and it was during this phase that the mayor, that our mayor, London Breed declared a local emergency in the Tenderloin, um, which really allowed the city to work faster than it normally does, um, primarily in two areas. One, it helped us to get um, a linkage center up and running in a matter of about two weeks that would have taken months. And then secondly, for the health department to really accelerate hiring, um, which was absolutely needed to support the services component. And then what comes next is that in June, we are going to, oh, and then I just wanna say that the emergency declaration was 90 days. It did, um, it did expire, so to speak, in March. We have not changed anything. But basically those two things that I referred to, the linkage center and then the hiring, those things were complete. Um, the only thing that really remains, which was a supplement was, was we do have disaster service workers. So employees, city employees who are assigned from other departments um, to support the initiative and, and they will be in place till June. And that's the final phase in June, we're going to transition to a more sustained operation that will focus on continuing the work that we're doing, but also on long-term resource allocation and programming. Um, and uh, what that looks like is in sort of a planning process right now. We can go to the next slide. Um, so our approach um, really is we need to acknowledge and understand that social services and harm reduction alone won't help the people of the Tenderloin and neither would a law enforcement approach. We need both safety and help helping measures um, along with community investments. As the city of St. Francis, I believe that we remain true to our namesake. Um, we know that people are the casualties of decades of inequality and racism, lack of access to healthcare. Um, and so we have led and will continue to with compassion and services first. Um, we need to exhaust every resource at our disposal to help people through challenges. Um, the resources that we have put to this have been our homeless outreach teams, our behavioral health teams, street crisis response, the newly launched street wellness team. And these, these teams continue to be at the forefront of our efforts. Um, and uh, we need to put every resource that we have to people who are in crisis. Um, and this is a whole community. And so we also have to deal with the reality that there are destructive activities and behaviors in this community that are harming the community at all, at whole, as a whole. And the harms that we are referring to, and most of you are well aware of, are children who are terrorized on their way to and from school and after school programs and the beautiful parks that we have in the neighborhood. Um, older adults and people with disabilities who have to go into the street to go to appointments or, or go to the store and they can't get by on the sidewalks. Um, when people who are selling highly addictive and deadly drugs like fentanyl and methamphetamines 
These drugs cause death and destruction and that is harm to the community. And, um, and really the number one concern for everyone is violence, intimidation and uh, really widespread public uh, substance use. Um, and that forces families, seniors, immigrants, merchants, and workers to really be prisoners in their own buildings, and that is harmful. So in order to address all of these complex problems effectively, we, will, we do need our helping measures, we need our safety measures, and we need our community um, investments. Um, I have a video for the next slide that just shows a little bit about how this all comes together. The Tenderloin is home to families, immigrants, seniors, merchants, workers, and the housed and unhoused, who all deserve a thriving neighborhood to call home. The Tenderloin Emergency Initiative was launched to improve safety, reduce crime, connect people to services, and increase investments in the neighborhood. The Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing is responsible for providing resources to people living on the street. We can do assessments on the street to see what people are eligible for as far as permanent housing. We also link people with shelter when it is available. That could be congregate shelter, that could be a navigation center. The homeless outreach team links people with those resources and the Tenderloid needs those resources more than anywhere else in the city. Community paramedics are fulfilling a variety of roles during the Tenderloin Emergency Initiative. They're staffing a variety of our street teams, our street crisis response team, our street overdose response team, and our newly launched street wellness response team. We have received feedback from community members, from residents, from our community-based organizations that we need an extra level and an extra level of impact and more impactful care to serve this community's needs. And that is what the fire department and community paramedics are bringing today to this initiative. The staff at San Francisco Community Health Center has really taken up the initiative of providing um, a community-based outreach for the neighborhood. So we're out there at this point, Monday through Saturday, just letting residents know that this is a service that they can access, really just describing the service, you know, the showers, the laundry, the food, all the different resources and referrals that can be made, um, and really just providing the neighborhood with a, like, a face of, you know, this is something that we've seen, this is something that we've seen work, um, and it's something that you can trust. Together, city and community-based teams work daily to connect people to services, clean streets, repair streetlights, and address hazardous conditions. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks to the team that put that together. So, um, we have conducted what we call joint field operations um, throughout this initiative. Um, and this is, what, this is something that we do using multi-agency, a multi-agency incident management team um, that we have common goals and objectives, share information and do coordination daily. Um, and these operations are done seven days a week. Uh, the effort focuses on outreach and engagement and care for people who are in crisis, and also includes maintaining clean, safe, and accessible streets, and conducting interventions and enforcement when we have harmful behaviors and people are hurting each other. I think that overall, the joint field operations is probably one of the has been one of the most effective operations for the the um, benefit and the improvement that people can actually see and feel in the community. Um, the participants are, are similar to some of our other outreach teams, but it's the homeless outreach team. You saw Mark Meza was one of the folks speaking. Um, we have clinicians from behavioral health at DPH, the street crisis response team, our street overdose response team, and the new wellness response team. And then in addition, we uh, our partners are Public Works and MTA, the fire department and the police department are part of that effort. Um, and these also, um, we also have had community and do community-based partners who are part of the outreach, especially depending on which area we're in. Um, and so again, these are seven day a week operations. The map on this slide sort of shows the, where we are. Um, the green circles are, are resolutions by um, HSOC. And over the course of this uh, operation, over 620 people have been placed into shelter housing. 
I just want to repeat that 620 individuals off the street into housing or shelter. Um, and next slide talks a little bit about our, um, again, um, so where are people going and what are the referrals? So we have housing referrals, um, shelter in place or winter shelter hotels, which are basically the same as SIP, um, all different kinds of shelter. Uh, and then also an, a very good number, um, and I don't have the final number right now, I don't think it's in here, but um, up to about 200 people into permanent supportive housing uh, referral, to, which is really significant. Um, and then in addition, we have um, sidewalks, streets, waste, debris pickup. I think the last number I saw was like over 3,000 tons of waste removed from the, from the streets and almost 2,000 power washings have happened during this event. Um, and so uh, that is really has been a huge core of the operations in the community. Next slide. I referred earlier to our community, or maybe it was before the meeting, um, that we spend a lot of time listening um, to people who live and work um, in the community and uh, almost on a daily basis. And um, what people have fed back to us, and we track the feedback. Uh, very closely and document it um, is number one, more resources to address safety. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people want more police resources and presence uh, to reduce drug sales, violent crime and help safe passage and accountability. And when I say, I say uh, police presence, because it's not that people are saying, you know, we want police to come scorch earth and we want people thrown into jail, but that people wanna feel safer. And there is, um, they feel that when police are present, uh, that that there is a, a higher level of safety in the community, um, with some exceptions. We can talk about that later. Um, and then again, keeping the streets healthy, safe, and accessible. Um, it is a very dense community. There, it is the highest concentration of families live within this neighborhood in our city. And being able to have safe passage is critical, critical to, to the thriving of this community. Um, and then uh, the other thing is displacement. And so because we've been focused so much in this constrained area, what we're seeing is some of the problems in the Tenderloin have moved into other areas, especially south of Market um, and a little bit over on the other side of Venna. So those are things that we are working on that we anticipated, but that we have to we can't, we have to follow with the, with the services and work that we're doing there. And then uh, next slide, we will talk about some of our, uh, a little bit more, um, the community ambassadors who are on the street have done incredible work and are generally very well um, regarded. Um, they have really helped um, to promote safe and thriving streets. Um, our outreach teams are more successful when they're resourced. So the outreach teams are incredible. They do a wonderful job connecting with people, but if they connect with someone and get them ready for the next step and they don't have the resources, then the work is, it really devalues the work. And so um, it has been helpful that we've had dedicated resources to the Tenderloin during this time. <coughs> Um, we have some, we do have an increasing issue of folks that we find in the street, um, back in the street in tents who actually have a place to live. It's not a huge number, but it's, it's a growing percentage. And so, um, so, you know, working with behavioral health partners to get folks back inside um, and uh, to figure out what are the impediments to that? What, what do we need to do? And some of that is actually a lot of working and, and this is gonna be something that I'm gonna be working on with some of the providers is how do, how do we, you know, what's going on within these housing and how do we support housing providers um, to support clients? They do an incredible job, but what other resources do they need? Um, and so um, 
again, there's many reasons for that um, that we can go into. Um, and then again, um, we've got to have everybody working together, uh, clinicians, outreach workers, the medical component, which has been incredible with EMS-6 and the paramedics that are on the various teams. But also at times, you know, we also have to have DPW in there because we, we've got to keep things clean. We have to support people for, with that and our law enforcement partners um, to keep our staff safe, but also to focus on the true law enforcement issues that really outreach teams cannot and should not be dealing with. Um, and uh, so we've been dealing with a lot of, you know, what are the kind of rules of the street? What are the, what is the accountability that we want to have? And everyone is part of this community in the Tenderloin, whether you are a person experiencing homelessness, whether you have substance use disorder, whether you're running a business or you're a family trying to survive. And, and so coming together to have accountability from everyone for everyone um, is really the path that we're trying to get to. Um, and so I wanna have time for us to talk. So let's go to the next slide, um, which is what's next. Um, so we have seen some success in the last, uh, since the first 90, now more than four, almost four, I guess four months now. Um, Community and city partners are much more unified and working better as a team. The Linkage Center is up and running and it is a place that people want to go. There are hundreds of people that are going there every day and they are seeking, and it is a safe place and a place where they can seek help when they're ready. And then the joint field operations, I think has been an incredible um, success uh, in, in doing block to block work in the, in the community. Um, we're super proud of the work, but we did have a rough start. Um, we started literally at the very height of the Omicron surge. We were super impacted by staffing in the very beginning. Um, and so I think it's pretty incredible what we've been able to do, but across the board, um, both on the city side and the contractor side, it was, it was, it, we were, we had a small group of people doing all the work because we had a lot of uh, folks down. Um, and so uh, the, um, so that is why we are continuing to do our crisis response through June. Um, and um, we are working, as I indicated on the transition. Um, the Department of Emergency Management, we are crisis managers and we really need to get the tenderloin down to a below crisis level. It's not that we're gonna have it perfect and everything resolved. DEM will still be involved ongoing in the tenderloin through our HSOC and our work with the street response teams. But um, we also have a mission in this city. We have to be ready for earthquakes and summer heat and fires and all the other things that are gonna happen. And so we wanna make sure that we have a team in place and that we keep tenderloin going, but we also have to um, you know, sort of have an exit plan so that we can also be doing the other work we need to do citywide. Um, and so finally, you know, uh, we will continue to a big part of this, uh, next slide, Francis, the a big part of this is um, transparency and data. Um, you can stay informed by going to SFGov at Tenderloin Initiative. We update our data weekly. Um, we're constantly trying to improve the data that we put out there. Um, but I think if you are interested, it is um, helpful to see uh, what in all different areas, um, what we're doing. So um, with that, I will end the presentation and happy to entertain questions. Thank you so very much, Mary Ellen, for this comprehensive presentation. Uh, it's a mammoth task. And, uh, and we know that you are doing your best with the resources you have. Um, knowing the passion behind this issue, we, we uh, 
We extended an invitation to the faith leaders of San Francisco and those religious institutions that are uh, uh, involved in the tenderloin, and we received a number of question, uh, answers back, responses back. And so we'd like to use the balance of the program uh, to put them to you. I, I know that you touched on a lot. We'll give you an opportunity to drill down on some of these. Um, and we will bundle because there were a number of questions that had a, uh, a similar uh, um, focus. And so we will, we will bundle those, but we will give recognition to all of those who asked. Uh, the first question came from Hala Hijazi, uh, who is a member of our board and is also a, a San Francisco Human Rights Commissioner um, and uh, is our representative uh, from the Muslim community. Uh, she says, children's safety is a major issue in the tenderloin and led to this initiative. What is the city doing to address the requests to provide safe passage routes uh, from their homes or neighborhoods to uh, school buses and schools? Thank you. Um, thanks, Michael, and thanks, Hala. Um, the ch children's safety is a major issue in the Tenderloin and really, I think, in many ways led to the, this initiative. Um, the mayor and I met with families from the Tenderloin um, in December, and uh, the mayor shortly after declared the emergency. Um, we were there and listened, and it was very, very difficult to hear um, from mothers, from children, and from families about what they need to go through. Um, and so, you know, in that, so increasing safe passage is one of the top priorities uh, of the initiative. And we have been, um, I don't know if, if you've been in the Tenderloin during the school, going to school and, and leaving, it is incredible. The entire community jumps in to, um, to clear the passage for the kids. It's PD on motorcycles, it's volunteers from the CBD, it's neighbors, it's just incredible. And it's like a parade um, and uh, of getting the kids through safe passage. And still we've had incidents. Um, and so, you know, I think that that is what we're continuing to do. We have some infrastructure changes and some proposals that the community has put forward to help with this that we're working to hopefully get funded. But um, it's absolutely one of the most important uh, focuses. Getting kids to school in the morning and the afternoon, I think, is is working pretty well. But you know, kids go to after school programs, and on the weekends they have to go out. You know, we shouldn't have to shut down the whole neighborhood. And we can't, you know, every time someone quick gets out, the goal is at any time of the day is safe. Um, and so th those are a lot of the, the um, focuses that we've had. Um, but safe passage has, has come a long way and it's a pretty impressive and touching uh, activity that happens every day. Thank you. Um, Deacon Miguel Bustos, who is the Senior Director for the Center of Social Justice at the Glide Foundation, and you know Glide is in the heart of the Tenderloin, asks this question. Could you give us a status update on the planned creation of the Tenderloin Emergency Initiative dashboard intended to collect and track data and demographic information, as well as analyze trends? Yeah. So um, as my last si slide showed, um, we do have our dashboards are live and they have been, I think for the last month, we've also been posting our situational reports weekly since we started. Um, but the dashboards that we have now include um, increasing connections to cares so that looks at that looks at um, data on how many people are connecting with various mental health and other uh, services, public health services reducing fatal and non-fatal overdoses. So we report on that from the OME's office and also our EMS, EMS data. So we look at um, people who have died from overdoses and then we also look at people who have not, um, who have been reversed, but who have we've responded to. Um, we, we have data on homelessness and streets sleeping. We have PD data on violent crime and drug sales. Um, we report on the sidewalks and streets um, and then increasing safe passage and accessibility. 
One of the areas that a lot of our data, however, I'll just say is very much operational data. It's sort of like, what have we done? Um, and we're working to uh, put together some more qualitative, um, you know, impact focused data on, you know, how has this changed the neighborhood um, for the better? It, do people feel safer? Um, and, and, and other measures. So, I, you know, I think for me, one of my biggest frustrations has been getting this off the ground. Um, and it's, we should be quantifying and sharing what we do, um, but we also need to do a better job of, uh, of tracking the impact of what we do. And so uh, there'll be more to come on that. Thank you. Um, Reverend Monique Ortiz, pastor of St. Mary and Martha Lutheran Church, which is on South Van Ness, and she's also the director of community programs for the San Francisco Night Ministry in the Open Cathedral. She is down there often. Uh, she's a member of our board as well. Um, Asked the question, why wasn't the emergency initiative used to open up needed treatment programs and housing instead of just using it to open linkage center to connect people to programs that perhaps do not have beds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the linkage center has been a key element of the initiative, um, in part because there was such a need at the baseline street level to have a place for people to go. Um, there is still, when you look at the dashboards, the actual completed linkage to programs is still pretty low. But the overall necessity, you know, the, the connection to the linkage center is fairly high. What people have mostly wanted at this linkage center are basic necessities of food and water, the showers, hygiene, a safe place to be, and housing services. Um, and um, we have been able to, through this process, as I said, 620 people assigned uh, have been provided a safe place off the street. And that has been primarily um, hotel rooms that were open specifically, SIP hotels that were repurposed for winter shelter for the Tenderloin. So I do think that from the basic needs and what people who are experiencing crisis in the street want right now, the, the initiative has provided. Um, and you know, I think part of the challenge is that there are many, many people that are not, you know, the way that I have, I'm not a I'm not a public health professional, so I have to be careful about how I you know, I try to use the words that public health uses, but that people are pre-contemplative to, to receiving any sort of treatment or um, getting where they where they are. And so that is why part of the reason that the harm reduction um, program is, is key. We do have beds every single day that are available um, for folks. They may not always be the exact type that people need to be matched with. Um, that's the kind of data that, that I'm also always pushing DPH also to um, tighten up so that we understand, you know, we know we have beds, but do we have the right ones uh, for the population that we're seeing? So, and I, you know, um, our partners that do supportive housing, they've added over 860 beds um, over the course you know, of almost this period of time, and they have 400 more that are planned to be opened. Um, they are acquiring more uh, supported housing units. And so all of this is part of the larger, a larger plan um, to keep things going. Uh, Reverend Paul Trudeau, the co-director from City Hope asks four questions, two I can bundle. Um, and uh, I think they're all valid uh, questions. One of them, uh, two of them have to do with businesses in the, in the Tenderloin. Uh, initially he asks, what is the city doing to penalize businesses and landlords who do not maintain their properties and are enabling rampant drug use and crime in the Tenderloin? 
And then he asks, what is the city doing to incentivize businesses to continue to keep the tenderloin clean and safe? Yeah, thank you. So um, this is why, <laughs> this is a great question. And this is why um, we are needing to develop sort of the more, the, the growth and sustainability kind of structure for this community. Um, the Department of Emergency Management is somewhat of a jack of all trades, but where I really limit um, our sort of ability to affect change is sort of economic development um, and uh, some of these business um, issues around, um, you know, around maintaining, uh, the, you know, they're really, um, there are legal issues that that need that do require enforcement, but also again require work primarily. I mean, San Francisco is not going to come. Uh, I think you know with uh, bats around, <laughs> and as an analogy, but we want to try to help people to be successful. So to that end, um, we are pulling in both the planning department and office OEWD, Office of Economic and Work Workforce Development, and they are putting a team together um, with folks that are going to be able to kind of have the access and the knowledge and those relationships better to work with businesses. In the meantime, we are doing everything that we can. Um, public, our part. That's why our partnership with Public Works is so important because. Um, we know that uh, there's some issues that are just, you know, issues around, you know, maintaining your business and not put, you know, having recycling going that, that are more like trash and sort of blight issues. And then there's other issues that um, fall more into a legal bucket. And so we're bringing the right people to the table, I think, to, to deal with those things. He also asked, what is the role of the San Francisco Police Department in addressing our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness and mental health issues? Very limited. Um, we have, uh, we essentially asked PD to kind of stand down in our initial, um, in our initial uh, approach to this, to, to this crisis, stand down. <laughs> Um, when it comes to people experiencing homelessness and drug addiction, um, as long as, you know, they weren't at this, you know, if there, if there were actual law enforcement issues, if there was issues of violence and other things, of course, they, we want them to do their job. But when it came to people in crisis, we took the, um, we really wanted to go uh, and have been approaching with services only. And we will, we, it was sort of like, we'll call you when we need you type of thing. Um, the police department has a lot of problems that need, they need to focus on in this community. They also do need to have a, more of a presence and have uh, in the last um, 30 days or so have had um, additional resources, which, which has been very welcomed by the community. So um, they are doing their job. Um, and we are trying to do our best. And, uh, and that's part of the reason the Linkage Center has been so important is to have an alternate place for people to go um, as, as such, because people using drugs and being out in the street is harmful to many people and the activities that go on there, having a place for people to go that is safe for them, but also create safety for the community was very critical. So that's, that's basically, in a nutshell, our relationship with PD in this. Reverend Trudeau's final question, and I'm going to bundle it with uh, a question from uh, Reverend Fred Harrell, uh, the senior pastor at City Church in San Francisco, because City Hope came out of City Church. Um, uh, Paul asks, uh, as the city works toward addressing our housing crisis and seeks to address the encampments in the Tenderloin, how will we effectively provide services to those living on our streets? Are we making progress in helping people get off our streets or are we just moving them to the next block? And with that, uh, Reverend Harrell asks, what is the city's plan to deal with the tent encampments? Right, so within the Tenderloin, um, we have uh, had enormous resources 
to offer people who are experiencing homelessness, which is why we have been able to get hundreds of people off the street. And frankly, with the exception of few pockets, generally speaking, large tent encampments are not an issue in the core of the Tenderloin at this point. Um, as I mentioned, we do often see folks, or we do at times, anywhere between 10 to 30 percent of folks that we see in the street, we have provided and they have an active room or sometimes permanent supportive housing. And so really trying to address the issues of why people return to the street is part of the um, challenge that we have. But also as far as large encampments across the city, um, HSOC, the Healthy Streets Operations Center, continues to um, do the work of encampment resolution for large encampments. Um, the way that we do that work is that we do approach encampments with resources. Um, we can't, by law, we don't go and just tell people to, you know, you, you got to get out of here. We work with them um, to figure out what their situation is um, and, you know, to provide the services that are gonna help them on the path off the street. Um, there are times that, and absolutely it, ha it does happen that people are us un not interested in the services that we have. Um, and they, there, is, there is movement of people around the city and you know, we continue to work with, with folks. Um, it, you know, the, the work that these outreach teams do from the, Department of, from the fire department, from public health, from homelessness and supportive housing is, is truly God's work. I, I go out as often as I can with outreach teams. I tell them I have a lot of influence on the decisions that affect them and the work they do. And so it's important to me to see it and experience it. Um, and they're truly dedicated. Um, they, uh, all these different teams work together. They tend to float personnel from the teams and they know people. That's what I always tell people who aren't in San Francisco, who may not know about this work. It's pretty rare, I think, that there's a person that you see in a tent that hasn't been touched by, um, by service workers. Um, they are out there every day. They know people's stories and um, are constantly doing everything they can to get people to a better place. But two things you have to understand, people are, people don't have, we don't have a lot of, unless people are, you know, gra and gravely ill and danger to themselves or others, you can't force people into housing. You can't force people into treatment. Um, and, and it takes a lot of work at times to get people um, to move. At the same time, we are really trying to push accountability for everyone, um, especially in certain areas, especially when you have a lot of kids around or seniors. I, I just believe that, you know, even folks that are in crisis, I think, can be, can be, um, involved in, in this work and, and in the, um, the goal of accountability and making our community better. So that's a lot to say that um, I just, I just want to say that the work that the folks are doing on a daily basis is incredible. Um, and they need more resources <laughs> in order to do it. Um, but they're doing the best job they can, I think, under these circumstances. We received a question from uh, Jennifer Friedenbach, who's the executive director of the Coalition on ha Homelessness. Uh, she's not a faith leader, but um, she is doing a lot of advocacy on behalf of the homeless in San Francisco and has historically. She asks, since increases in public safety are much higher when investments are made in social service programs as opposed to the police, can you talk about what non-policing investments have occurred, such as in CART, the Compassionate alternative response team program? Um, well, we, there's been incredible uh, investment in 
non-policing. Um, we actually spent the afternoon at the Board of Supervisors yesterday at a budget hearing talking about all of the street response teams. So um, in particular, we have HSOC, which started with a very kind of police focused and driven approach that now basically does its work without PD. Um, well, that isn't, that isn't, that's not, I wanna give PD credit. They are our partners in it. But if you talk about tip of the spear, they're really like the feather at the end, keeping our, our, our folks safe and backing us up when we need it. Um, HSOC, there's the street crisis response team, there's the street overdose response team, and then there's the street wellness team, which recently, um, which recently started. And that team is a team of uh, homeless outreach workers, paramedics, and behavioral health folks who are out doing wellness checks on people that you see on the street, the type of folks that you see, and you're like, that person seems like they need help, but aren't necessarily, you know, you're not like, maybe this isn't a 911 call. And so um, I think that the, the investments have been significant um, and that we are at the point right now in which we're evaluating those investments. And then also um, there, there's gonna be a hearing soon um, about CART where we're gonna talk about some of this thing. Um, CART is a concept, it, but uh, ultimately, we would we welcome and I think we could absolutely use a community component, um, but whatever we do has to be, I think that scope of work needs to be defined by the city and it has to work in, in, in within this continuum. Um, again, access to resources, out, street outreach without access to resources is you know an impossible task in many ways. And so, um, whatever we do will be thoughtful, um, and and uh, you know I think a community component to our overall response um, is something that uh, we would we are exploring that we want to explore, and we have to be really careful about how we figure out how that fits into the overall system. But I'm looking forward to working on that. I recently hired someone who's going to help us, um, who's going to be working around coordination of all these teams. Um, she starts in May, and so that's going to be one of the things that she works on. As I mentioned at the outset, we had a, a number of questions who, uh, that, that had a, a similar focus. Before we get to them, um, I, I, Nancy Nielsen is with us, and she had a question. Um, and uh, Nancy, would you pose your question, and then we'll come back and finish up with these and Bishop Megan's. Sure. Thank you, thank you. It's so good to hear what's happening. Um, I was sort of lamenting to Michael that since I've been retired, my days are not spent in the TL and are not spent with conversations and, and supportive activities with the people who are working on the same issues. And now I find myself in a lot of different neighborhoods away from the TL and talking with people who just go, what is happening with a homeless problem and why aren't they doing more? And why didn't, you know, it's very difficult to have those conversations. And what comes out of that um, is their question of how can you convince me, this is the speaker, mm -hmm. that you have a plan that is practical and will solve the homeless problem within a reasonably short period of time, maybe 12 to 18 months. And keep in mind that their perception is the way the city and the state have dealt with this problem over the past 10 years hasn't been successful. And so they're very skeptical that the efforts are just cosmetic, they're just you know, dealing with public outrage, but there's no sustained political willpower needed. And I'm, I understand that feeling. It is frustration. There are folks who dearly love the city and it breaks their heart to drive the streets and see the, the agony on a daily basis. And I don't have those answers. I have the frustrations. Um, I understand what they say, but I also know the stories of the people on the street and the people trying to help. And is there a long range perspective for finding some way to get information to these skeptics that might change their hearts a bit, that might make a difference. How do you deal with that? That's a, that's a huge pressure, I know. Yeah, well, I mean, really out of respect for the 
my colleagues who have devoted their lives to, you know, homeless, resolving homelessness and building housing. I started as a nonprofit housing developer, but so I know the world a little bit, but I, you know, I think out of respect for a lot of people who have devoted their life to that particular question, I don't, I, I, I don't think I have the answer. Um, I have a few thoughts. Um, first of all, you know, my job is to deal, I, I really represent public safety. Um, I'm, an, I'm a crisis manager. And so me and my team are here to, what are the action that we can take immediately now to mitigate the harm that's happening and, um, and lower the level of crisis, right? So street outreach is about meeting people where they are in the street right now. And how do we, you know, how do we address the question that that's the problem that's happening here now, either, um, you know, this, this, uh, you know, you are in harm's way, um, which most of the time that's the case. Um, the situation is ca causing harm for the community in some way. And, you know, how do we resolve this as quickly as possible? Um, I think in the short term, and this isn't always, this is not popular with a lot of people, but I do think that shelter, like, and, and the kind of shelter that people feel comfortable in, um, we need more of it. I think that there is obviously the answer for many, it seems to be like is housing and housing for all and having that. And of course that's the case, but what do you do in this interim period for people until that gets there? You know, you want to drive, you want to keep driving the demand and the need for it, but, you know, keeping people in the street in the meantime, doesn't feel like the right the right answer to that. So some sort of interim structure where we're able to have people. But then again, I, I bring up this issue of people who are in shelter and end up back on the street, not to not to like villainize people and say like, oh, we gave you a room and you ended up, um, but to say like, people have issues, you know? And also I don't, I have a really nice house, you know, comparatively speaking, I don't like to spend all my time in it, right? Like, um, and so if you live in a small SRO or in a shelter bed, you know, people are going to be out and about. And so I think sometimes, you know, that, that is an issue. Um, and then the, the, but, uh, and here's the other thing I'll say, we as a city have to, I think, do continue to sh put a mirror on ourselves and reflect and see and really analyze and use data and look at where we are effective and, and where we're not. And that isn't easy, right? All the time. I think there's, we tend to be a lot of people that are doing really passionate work. We're doing good and we're passionate about the work we're doing, but it's a huge city. It's a lot of bureaucracy. It's a lot of money that goes to these services. And um, we need to continue um, evaluating that work and, and understanding where it's working and where it maybe isn't. Um, and that's part of what emergency, and that's just my perspective, because when you're in emergency management, you're in an, like an initiative like this, we are on a daily or weekly basis, like reevaluating. Um, I think sometimes, and it kind of has to be like this, you know, you build a program, um, that's more permanent and you come back once a year or whatever and evaluate it. What we do is, and it's not, you know, it's that's why it's so resource intensive is that we're constantly like every week going, okay, what are our numbers? Did this work? And then, oh, it didn't. So we're going to pivot. And it's a little bit of a luxury you have when you're in an emergency structure, but it's hard to, it's hard to like manage a government <laughs> like that. So but figuring out how to do that better. And I think we have an, we, we do have that opportunity now with this initiative um, to, you know, really look at what are the things that are helping and then what are, how do we connect to the long-term backend uh, that exists and is the backend what it needs to be? And maybe it is, but you can't like, is navigating it or accessing it a problem? Like where are the choke points? 
um, because we do have a lot of uh, so many services. And the final thing I'll say, and this is also very controversial, but it is it is true and it's okay. It just is what it is. San Francisco is a is a magnet of sorts. I mean, we do have. We do have people that come, uh, I think, um, for our services and for our compassion. And, and I don't, and I say that not by saying that there's anything wrong with it, um, but sometimes because that may seem controversial, it, I think it, it sets unexpected expectations. Like if that's the way it is, then, then that's, that's how it is. You know? And that we're not the only city that's like that. Um, the city of Philadelphia, which is where I was born and raised, they have been doing um, a similar type of operation for, for like almost three years. And, you know, one of the, they've had a lot of success, but they still have their regional, their kind of a regional uh, collection point for folks with a particular issue. And, um, and that in talking to them, which I talk to them pretty regularly, they're like, yeah, we get, we're, you know, we're honing, we're getting better and everything, but we have a steady flow um, of folks who are gonna need help. And so again, I speak mostly, I just wanna caveat, like I speak mostly as a crisis manager, my job is really to do that. And, you know, I really wanna defer to the colleagues, you know, my, my colleagues and advocates and people who are, who have been spent their life trying to resolve homelessness. I can only speak from, you know, the position that I'm in um, and what, what we're seeing in this current, current situation. Uh, on that note, realizing that you can't do it alone, the series of questions and the, the very thoughtful uh, uh, questions coming from folks that are on the ground, uh, they ask a common question and how can we help? But out of respect for them, I'd like to, to, to put forth the nuances that they asked. You only have to answer one question at the end, okay? Uh, from Nils Banke, the Chief Executive Officer of St. Anthony Foundation, uh, Nils says, um, the tenderloin comes out worse than other neighborhoods in San Francisco for almost any metric, from overdoses to life expectancy to income to education levels. How can we be, how can we as a faith-based organization be cooperative with your department to achieve tangible results for all those we are called to serve? And that includes people experiencing homelessness and substance uh, use disorders, the residents of the TL, especially the children, but also the team members and the volunteers. Uh, the most Reverend Salvatore Cordelione, Archbishop of San Francisco, of the Archdiocese of San Francisco asks, faith communities are already providing critical social services and spiritual support in the Tenderloin District. From the standpoint of the Department of Emergency Management, what is the most helpful thing we as faith leaders can do to support the work of the Department of Emergency Management in the Tenderloin? Reverend Marcy O. Glass, the pastor and head of staff at Calvary Presbyterian Church, Again, what tangible things can faith communities do to help? Um, the Reverend Canon Anna E. Rossi, Canon presenter and director of interfaith engagement at Grace Cathedral asks, the Tenderloin Emergency Initiative aims to provide immediate interventions to a neighborhood that is challenged by precarity as well as crime, mental and public health crises, Part of emergency initiative is also connections to care. What role does the DEM envision faith communities will or could play in number one, the immediate, and number two, the ongoing care of our neighbors? Uh, rabbi Beth Singer, uh, the senior rabbi at Congregation Emmanuel starts off, first, thank you for the work that you do to help our most valuable residents. I imagine we are not aware of even a fraction of what you and your departments do to help so many people in need. Regarding the Tenderloin, over and over, we hear that there simply are not enough mental health services available, enough beds available, enough addiction programs available to get people off the streets and into diverse kinds of treatment and shelter programs that could really make a long-term difference and give them an alternative to street living. So tell us, what can we as a religious community do to advocate 
for the dramatic increase to the panoply of mental health recovery and housing needs to help the people on the streets of the Tenderloin. Who should we be talking to? How can we make this priority for the city and for the state? Again, thank you for doing this very hard and humbling and humane work. What you heard there is, is something that's in the DNA of communities of faith. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, Mary, Mary Ellen, that in times of crises, um, the faith community steps up and wants to do something. So this is your chance. Uh, to, to dream dreams and ask us what you need. Yeah, thank you. So I, I was just sort of writing down a few thoughts as you, I hear these questions come in. So first of all, I think one of the challenges we have is lifting the voices of people in this community. Um, and uh, it is, I, I think we also need to, to like, it, it infits me and is very upsetting when I think about what we allow in this community that would not be allowed for five minutes in some of the other communities around our beautiful city. And, and I don't know why that is. Well, I know some reason. I think part of it is that the people that are in this community's voices, they, they don't have the positions of privilege, the time and the luxury of advocacy for themselves. Um, and I think that we have struggled even in this initiative to lift those voices in a way that that needs to be lifted. So, so that's one thing. Um, of course, you know, how do you do that? Well, one is I think getting involved, right? And working with people directly so to, to understand, you know, what the challenges are. Um, but also, you know, then using our own voices at the local state and federal level to advocate for, uh, and our elected officials about, you know, what we need. Um, and to do that, you know, regularly and voraciously. <laughs> and then, you know, I think the, the other thing is just, um, is, you know, I'm losing my, uh, <laughs> my train of thought a little bit, but um, so lifting voices, talking to, um, to our elected officials, but also, um, you know, I think the, there's a lot of rhetoric and ideology that comes into play in these problems. Um, all police are bad, uh, you know, that, you know, people have certain things that around drug dealing, harm reduction, you know, it's, harm reduction is bad. And this is, there's so much rhetoric that we get like caught up in that I just, I, I can't believe it sometimes. Um, and so, I wish that those of us who had privilege and position and are able to, you know, make a difference is that we sort of um, can listen to each other a little more and bring down that rhetoric and ideology because there is no one secret answer to this people like that is for sure. Um, and coming together, I think is going to is is challenging in the city. And then finally, what I want to say is, you know, I've been in a lot of meetings also um, you know, around the reopening of the city and what businesses and theater and the city is all dealing with it. Like people don't want to come to San Francisco because, you know, it's dangerous and all this sort of thing. And, you know, I think, I, I, I don't really believe that. And statistically, it does not show that San Francisco is a particularly dangerous place, but it is scary. And it is, it is disturbing to see people who, are homeless for some people, you know, who are homeless or drug addicted or whatever. I, you know, it's triggering for me because I, for, you know, we all have our our issues and things from our background. So, um, you know, I think just a general, a, a more gentle narrative around this that we can speak to and to lift the stories of what San Francisco is doing, um, and uh, that yes, the fact is people come here because there's nowhere else for them to go. Mm -hmm. And we are the city of St. Francis. We are the place that 
you know, accepts people. And I think what we're running into is that we are also like, maybe we don't have enough services or some of this is causing harm to other folks. And so how do we really look at this from a, a truly co whole community perspective? So those are a few of my thoughts. Some of them are concrete and some of them are a little more out here, but I really appreciate the question. And we, we welcome help. I think that there are gonna be many opportunities within the community to support the community needs resources. Um, and, you know, as I feel that as Tenderling goes, so goes San Francisco. It truly is sort of the heart of our city. Um, and so it's really behooves all of us to, to do what we can to, um, to help it. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I, I'm reminded of a, a Mayor Lee of Blessed Memories uh, State of the City Address in 2014. He concluded it by enumerating all the different communities who came to San Francisco at one time or another. The only thing they all had in common was none of them were welcomed. Um, and he said, it's not our job to, to villainize the other, but to educate, to engage, and to welcome. Um, and each of us really needs to remember why we came here um, in order to, and, and to ask ourselves, what can we do to make the city a better place? So you have partners uh, and, um, and you have partners in the faith community. Uh, we'd like to bring this program to a close. We realize we've gone over time, but uh, with one last question from Bishop Megan Rohr, uh, who has herself uh, worked intensely on the streets, um, directly with those we've been talking about today. Bishop Megan, uh, you get the final word. Ooh, dangerous. Uh, first, I wanted to give you an update. We're getting a little farther along. <laughs> Beautiful, but crazy <laughs> messy. I don't know if that speaks to you, Mary Ellen. Yeah. Uh, I, I have always uh, appreciated about you, Mary Ellen, that you are someone who wears your heart on your sleeve, which is really impossible to do when you've lived through as many disasters as you've lived through. And so how you do that, I don't know, but thank God for, um, for how that is possible. Um, I heard a couple things while you were speaking. I heard that you uh, manage dispatch, right? And last week was dispatch appreciation week. Um, so yay for the dispatchers, and I know they're deeply in your heart. Uh, so that part of what you're doing is just dispatching services that other people might manage on a day-to-day -day basis, but you're helping to dispatch them. I heard, and one of my favorite things about you is you are a data nerd, that you are constantly going back, and based on what's requested, you're projecting forward what services uh, to try to create that are new. Um, and so I, so what I'm hearing in this is something that has maybe been something that is maybe the little known moral dilemma for many faithful people throughout San Francisco most of the time is when I see someone on the streets who needs help, who do I call? And in different decades, the number was 911. In other decades, the number was the non-emergency number. In a different decade, it was 311. Uh, knowing that you have trained dispatchers who have triaging plans about how to make this moral decision. Uh, should we spend all of the anxiety that we do on figuring out how to dispatch before we call dispatch? What is the current number we should call? And um, how, how does our calling or encouraging others who have a voice um, or who are in need of services to ask for what they actually need, not what they think they can get because of what we currently have. How does, how does our asking and our calling kind of create the services of the future and how does the dispatch happen? Yeah, thank you. I, I owe you one for teeing this one up. Um, so thank you. So um, again, in the hearing that we spent yesterday, um, hours with the board and Supervisor Walton has brought this up like, appropriately so. There are many folks that feel in communities where 911, like they're never gonna call 911, which is which we need to work on. So there are really three numbers that you can call in the city. It's 311, it's 911, or it's non-emergency. Um, so insider tip, 
same humans are answering the non-emergency and 911 calls, goes to the same place. Um, our, in fact, our dispatchers have gone through, are incredibly skilled, compassionate, dedicated people. They are trained to assess the emergency and dispatch the appropriate resource. Um, and, you know, a lot of people get upset when they're asked questions, like they're just like, send the crisis team, this person needs a crisis team. So we've got, you know, we're trying to get a lot of information out there for the public to let the dispatchers um, give them all the information they're asking for and let them help help uh, determine what is the best uh, re um, resource. And as we reported yesterday, um, the, the crisis team is currently backed up by SFPD. I won't get into all the details, but basically if we don't have enough crisis teams for every call, I think we're covering about 60%. Um, but starting in June, we're gonna get a, another team and then the backup to every skirt call, if skirt's not available, is gonna be a paramedic. So it'll be a medical call. So for many people, that's a huge deal that it won't be PD. And PD agrees, like PD doesn't wanna be the primary, they don't wanna be the first responders to behavioral health calls. At times, there may be a behavioral health crisis in which you need PD because people in harm's way, there could be a weapon, all these kind of things. So thank you for that. We're happy to provide, um, we have a great make the right call, um, but, don't hesitate. I, the worst thing could happen is to hesitate calling um, because you're not sure, because that could be a life or death situation for the person. And you should just know that the city is putting so many resources into dispatching alternate to policing and the right resources. But the fact is many times a, a dispatcher with information you provide may determine that is a medical call. Like this person needs a, you know, a code, code three, code a, a priority or, uh, you know, a code three call response. And we want that to happen. If that was your kid, if that was your parent, or if that was yourself, like if I always say, like, if I stroke out in the middle of, you know, mission street, I don't want people to like, feel like, should I call 911? No, please call. So, um, thank you. Thank you. for that. And thank, thank you, Mary Ellen and Bishop Megan and Nancy and, uh, and Cynthia Zambukas uh, on our staff and Trey Russell Allen and Diana Lasorda. Um, so as not to take the honor away from Reverend Brown for having the longest session on here, I'm gonna bring this to a close. Um, uh, but again, thank you to all. This was a, an incredible exchange. Uh, and we invite you to join us on Thursday, May the 5th, uh, when we will hear from key principals at Jewish Family and Children's Services on the, their Ukrainian refugee resettlement efforts. Um, thank you all who joined us online. And uh, once again, we will make available this recording link by day's end. Uh, we encourage you to share it with your communities who could not be on this call. God bless you and God keep you. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak to the, uh, our Muslim sisters and brothers who are observing and to the Orthodox Christians uh, who are observing Holy Week in anticipation of, of, of the resurrection, uh, we, we extend our prayers and blessings. God bless you and God keep you.